Hey folks, before we dive into today's stories, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more and longer stories. Let's enjoy. Story number one. So, let me start this off by saying I'm not the type of person to believe in ghosts, demons, or any of that paranormal stuff. I've always been the skeptic in my friend group, the guy who laughs at haunted house tours and thinks horror movies are ridiculous. But what happened to me last week? Man, it's changed everything. I wish this was some sick joke, but I swear on everything this is real and it's still messing with my head. It all started last weekend when a couple of friends came over for drinks. You know, the usual Friday night hangout, beer, some music, maybe a dumb card game or two. Well, my buddy Kevin, who's always into the weirdest crap, suggested we pull out a Ouija board he found at a thrift store. I should have known right then and there that it was a terrible idea. I mean, who the hell buys a second-hand Ouija board? But again, I was the skeptic, right? I didn't think anything of it. We sat in my living room, dimmed the lights for ambience. Kevin's idea and set the board on the coffee table. There were four of us, me, Kevin, my girlfriend Sarah, and our mutual friend Jake. We were all half drunk, not taking it seriously at all. It started with the usual stupid questions. Is there anyone here? Who are we talking to? All while we laughed like idiots, barely even touching the planchette. It moved slowly, spelling out random letters that didn't make sense. Probably one of us messing around to freak the others out. But then Sarah, who never really believed in this kind of stuff either, got quiet. Like, really quiet. Her eyes locked onto the board and she asked, dead serious, who are we talking to? The planchette jerked hard. No one was laughing now. We all just stared as it moved across the board faster than before. It spelled out one word, Lucifer. I'm telling you man, none of us were messing with it. The air in the room felt heavy like someone had sucked all the oxygen out. I laughed nervously and said, Okay, real funny, who's moving it? But Sarah was pale, her hands were shaking, and she looked at me with this expression I can't even describe, like she'd seen something horrible. Turn it off, she whispered. We need to stop. But Kevin, of course, thought it was hilarious and pushed the planchette to yes when I asked if it wanted to keep talking. That's when it all started to go downhill fast. The candles we had lit flickered and I swear the room got colder. I know it sounds like something out of a movie, but I'm not kidding. It felt like the whole vibe changed. The planchette started moving again, this time without any of us even touching it. It spelled out, mirror. At this point, Sarah had already backed out of the game, her face ghost white, saying she was done. I wanted to be done too, but Kevin and Jake? Nah, they kept going like idiots. The next thing the board spelled out was my name, James. I felt my stomach drop. You know that feeling when you know something is very, very wrong? That was me. My hands started to sweat, and I wasn't sure if I was going to puke or run out of the house. But before I could do anything, the planchette moved one last time. Look, bathroom, now. I wasn't drunk anymore, no one was. We all sat there, stunned, staring at the board, trying to process what just happened. I don't know why I did it, but I stood up, walked down the hall, and went straight to the bathroom. Kevin and Jake followed me, like we were all in some kind of trance. When I pushed open the bathroom door, everything was normal, at first. The lights were on, nothing out of place. I let out this awkward laugh, like, See? It's just a game, guys. But then I saw it. On the bathroom mirror, fogged up like someone had just taken a hot shower, was this image. It wasn't there before, I swear. None of us had been in there for hours, but there it was. A drawing of this... thing. It had horns, twisted and long, almost like branches. Its face was elongated, with sharp, jagged teeth and eyes that felt like they were staring directly into my soul. And underneath, scrawled in thick, dripping letters, was one word. Lucifer. I froze. I couldn't breathe. Couldn't move. The others behind me. They saw it too. Kevin turned pale. He wasn't laughing anymore. Jake mumbled something under his breath like he couldn't even form a full sentence. I just stood there. Locked in place, staring at this, this thing on my mirror that shouldn't be there. Then it got worse. The mirror, it started to crack. Slowly at first, like someone was pushing from the other side. The crack spread out, spider webbing across the glass, until the whole thing shattered with this deafening crash. We all jumped back and the room went dark. 
I was done. I ran out of there, and the others followed. We didn't stop until we were out of the house, standing on the street, panting like we'd just sprinted a marathon. None of us said anything for a good minute. What could we say? It was like we'd all experienced the same twisted nightmare. I don't know how to explain it, but ever since that night, things have been wrong. I've tried to clean up the broken mirror, but every time I walk into that bathroom, I feel like I'm being watched, like something is standing right behind me. The worst part, it's not just the mirror. Every time I look at a reflection, windows, car mirrors, even my damn phone screen, I see glimpses of it. That face, those eyes, just for a split second before they disappear. But I know it's there. I haven't told anyone else about this. Kevin and Jake haven't been around since that night. I've texted them, called them, but it's like they've just vanished. And Sarah, she broke up with me the day after, said she couldn't deal with the weird energy in my house. She didn't even say goodbye. I'm scared to sleep, man. I keep hearing whispers in the middle of the night. Little scratches coming from the bathroom, I swear. I've locked the door every time, but it's always open in the morning, and there's more writing on the walls. Words I don't understand, symbols. It's like something is waiting for me to figure it out. And honestly, I'm starting to think I don't want to know what happens when I do. After that night, I did everything I could to forget it. I threw the Ouija board in the trash, blocked Kevin and Jake's numbers, and stayed out of my bathroom as much as possible. But it didn't matter. The weirdness didn't stop. If anything, it got worse. The first thing I noticed were the scratches. At first, they were subtle, tiny little marks along the walls near the bathroom door. I thought maybe it was the paint chipping off, or that maybe the house was just getting old and creaky. But then the scratches started appearing in other places. I'd wake up in the morning and find long, thin claw marks on the walls in the hallway, in the kitchen, even in my bedroom. And it wasn't just the walls. I started noticing them on me too. I'd wake up and find these scratches on my arms, my legs, and sometimes right across my chest. At first, I tried to convince myself it was just me being clumsy. Maybe I scratched myself in my sleep or something. But then the marks started getting deeper. The kind of scratches you feel when you wake up, burning like someone had just clawed at your skin while you were asleep. I tried to ignore it. I really did. But ignoring something that's right in front of your face is harder than it sounds. And every time I'd look in the mirror, even for just a second, I'd catch a glimpse of that face. Lucifer. Always there. Lurking in the reflection. Just waiting. A couple days after the mirror shattered, I called a guy to come replace it. The weird thing, when he showed up and saw the broken glass, he refused to touch it. Said something about how it wasn't natural. I thought he was just some superstitious old dude, but the look on his face, like he knew something bad had happened in my house, creeped me the hell out. He didn't even charge me. Just left. Shaking his head like he wanted to be anywhere but there. So I was stuck with a broken mirror and a house that felt more like a prison every day. The worst part, though, the sounds. It started about a week after the mirror incident. At night, when everything was quiet, I'd hear it. At first, it was just a faint scratching sound, like someone dragging their nails across the floor. It was soft enough that I could convince myself it was the house settling, or maybe a branch brushing against the window. But after a few nights, the sound got louder, more deliberate. And it wasn't just coming from outside, it was coming from inside the house. The scratching started right outside my bedroom door, every night around 3am like clockwork. It would start as this slow, rhythmic drag across the floor, like something was crawling. I'd lie there, staring at the ceiling, hoping it was just my imagination. But it wasn't. I could hear it, clear as day. And then the whispers started. At first, I couldn't make out what they were saying. It was like someone was having a conversation just outside my door, their voices low and raspy. But after a few nights of listening, I started to catch words. Things I didn't want to hear. James. It was my name. Whispered in that same low guttural voice. I didn't sleep at all that night. I just lay there, frozen in bed, staring at the door, waiting for something to burst through and drag me out. But nothing ever did. The door would stay shut and by morning the house would be silent again, like nothing had ever happened. I couldn't tell anyone. Who would believe me? Hey guys, my house is haunted by Lucifer, and something is scratching at my door every night. Yeah, sure, I'd sound like a lunatic. So I kept it to myself, hoping it would stop. It didn't. One night, about two weeks after the whole thing started, I snapped. I 
couldn't take the whispers anymore. Couldn't take waking up covered in fresh scratches every morning. So I decided to confront whatever the hell was going on. I stayed up that night sitting in the dark with the bedroom door cracked open, waiting. It was 2.45am when I heard it. The scratching. Slowly. Methodically. Just like every night before. But this time, I was ready. I grabbed my phone, turned on the flashlight, and yanked open the door. There was nothing there. Just the hallway, empty and cold. I felt like an idiot, standing there in my boxes with my phone light on, expecting to see something. But just as I was about to go back to bed, I heard it. James? The voice was coming from the bathroom, from the broken mirror. I don't know what came over me, but I walked toward it. My feet felt like lead, every step heavier than the last. When I reached the bathroom door, I stopped. It was pitch black inside. The light switch wasn't working, of course. My hand was shaking as I reached for my phone again, shining the light into the bathroom. There, on the wall opposite the mirror, was a message, scrawled in what looked like blood, fresh, still dripping. Four simple words, I see you now. I dropped the phone. I must have blacked out because the next thing I remember was waking up in my bed, drenched in sweat, my heart pounding out of my chest. But the worst part, the scratches, they were everywhere now. Not just a few here and there, but all over my body. Deep, angry cuts that looked like someone had taken a razor to my skin. I wanted to scream, to cry, to run. But where the hell was I supposed to go? This thing, whatever it was, wasn't just haunting my house. It was haunting me. I didn't go to work that day. I couldn't. Every time I moved, the cuts burned like they were fresh. I spent most of the day staring at my reflection in what was left of the mirror waiting for Lucifer's face to appear again. It didn't, but I knew it was just a matter of time. That night, the scratching didn't come from the hallway. It came from inside my room. That night was the first time I realised, whatever this thing is, it's no longer just some ghostly presence hanging around. It's inside now, with me, in the same room. I know how that sounds, but I need you to understand, this isn't some hallucination. This isn't a nightmare I can wake up from. This is real. I hadn't slept for days at this point, surviving on caffeine and fear. My whole body felt like it was shutting down, but my brain wouldn't let me rest. Every time I closed my eyes, I could feel it watching. That night I laid in bed, covers pulled up to my chin like a damn kid, just waiting for the scratches to start. But this time, there were no scratches. No whispers. It was dead silent. That was somehow worse. I remember looking at the clock, 2.58am. My eyes were burning from exhaustion, and I was this close to passing out when I heard something. Not a scratch, not a whisper, but breathing. Slow, deliberate breaths right next to my bed, like someone standing inches from my face. My heart stopped. I didn't move, didn't even blink. I thought, maybe if I stayed still it wouldn't notice me. Stupid, right? But that's how scared I was. Then came the voice again. Deep, low, and raspy, but this time it wasn't whispering. It was speaking directly into my ear. James, I bolted upright in bed, and my heart nearly exploded out of my chest. There was no one there. The room was dark, but I swear, I felt something move, like the air shifted around me. That breathing didn't stop, though. It was still there, coming from the corner of the room now, by the closet. The closet door was cracked open just a little bit, Enough for me to see the darkness inside. I didn't want to look. Every instinct in my body told me to keep my eyes straight ahead. To ignore it. But I couldn't help myself. Slowly, I turned my head, shining my phone's flashlight toward the closet. The light hit something. Eyes. Not human eyes. These were red, glowing and cold. They stared back at me from the closet, unblinking like they'd been watching me for hours. My throat tightened and I felt like I was going to puke. I couldn't breathe. Those eyes. They didn't belong to anything living. Not something from this world, at least. My phone slipped from my hand and hit the floor, the light flickering out. I didn't dare move to pick it up. Instead, I just sat there, paralysed with fear, waiting for whatever was in the closet to come out. But it didn't. It stayed there, watching. I could hear it now the breathing getting heavier, faster, almost like it was excited. I wasn't sure what the hell to do. 
every muscle in my body was locked up and my mind was racing. Do I run? Do I scream? I didn't even know if my legs would work if I tried to move. So I did the only thing I could think of. I started praying. I hadn't prayed since I was a kid, but I didn't know what else to do. I just mumbled out some desperate half-assed prayer, hoping it would make whatever was in the closet leave. But the second I started praying, it laughed. This low, guttural chuckle that came from deep within the shadows of the closet, like it found the whole thing hilarious. The air in the room got colder, and I could see my breath in front of me. The laugh grew louder, more distorted, echoing around the room until it felt like it was coming from all directions. Do you think that will save you? The voice was no longer in my ear. It was in my head. I swear to God, it was like it was inside my skull, rattling around my brain, mocking me. And then the closet door creaked open a little more. I didn't wait to see what came next. I grabbed my phone and bolted out of the room, not even caring where I was going. I ran down the hall and into the living room, slamming the door behind me. My hands were shaking so bad I could barely hold the phone. I called Sarah. I don't even know why. We weren't together anymore. And she probably thought I was nuts. But she was the only person I could think of in that moment. She answered after a couple of rings, her voice groggy. James? It's three in the morning. What the hell? I didn't even know how to explain it. I was talking so fast, stumbling over my words, trying to tell her about the eyes, the voice, the laughing. She didn't believe me, of course. Who would? She just kept saying I needed to calm down. That it was probably just a bad dream. Maybe the stress of the breakup. But I knew this was real. It was too real. After about ten minutes of me babbling like a lunatic, Sarah finally agreed to come over. She showed up maybe twenty minutes later, looking half asleep and annoyed, but when she saw me her face changed. I must have looked like hell because the first thing she asked was if I needed to go to the hospital. I didn't answer. I just pulled her inside and locked the door behind her, triple checking it like that was going to do anything. I tried to explain again, a little slower this time, but she still didn't get it. James, you're freaking yourself out over nothing. You just need sleep. But then, mid-sentence, her eyes flicked toward the hallway, the one that led to my bedroom. Her face went pale. Did you... She started, but her voice cracked. She cleared her throat and tried again. Did you hear that? I froze. I hadn't heard anything. But the way she was looking down the hallway made my blood run cold. I could see her visibly shudder, and without another word she started walking toward the sound. I didn't want her to go, but I couldn't stop her. I just followed, my legs feeling like jelly beneath me. She stopped in front of my bedroom door, her hand hovering over the handle. I could see her hesitate, like she knew something bad was on the other side. She looked back at me, and for the first time since she'd arrived, I saw fear in her eyes. What's in there, James? she whispered. Before I could answer, the door slowly creaked open on its own. My heart felt like it stopped beating. The room was pitch black, but we both stood there, staring into the darkness like idiots. Then, out of the silence, we heard it. The laugh. It was louder now, almost booming, echoing through the hallway, rattling the walls. Sarah screamed and took a step back, but before she could run, the door slammed shut with a force that shook the entire house. The laughing didn't stop. It was all around us, coming from the walls, the floor, the ceiling. It was everywhere. Sarah grabbed my arm, her nails digging into my skin. What the hell is happening, James? I didn't know. I still don't know. But whatever was in my room, it was getting closer. We stood there, frozen, as the laughter grew louder. It wasn't human. It couldn't be. It echoed in the air like a physical force, shaking the walls, vibrating through my chest. Sarah was gripping my arm so tightly I thought she might break it, but I couldn't feel the pain. All I could feel was the overwhelming sense of dread, like the floor was about to drop out from under us, like whatever was in my room was coming for us. The door rattled violently, shaking like someone, or something, was trying to break it down. I stumbled backward, pulling Sarah with me, both of us staring at the door like we were expecting it to burst open at any second. My heart was pounding so loud in my ears I could barely hear anything else. But one thing was clear. Whatever was in that room wasn't staying there for long. Then it stopped. The door stopped shaking. The laughter cut off suddenly, like someone had hit a mute button. The silence that followed was suffocating. Sarah and I stood there, staring at the door, waiting, listening. 
The house felt too quiet, like the air itself had frozen. Sarah whispered, her voice shaking. James? What was that? What the fuck was that? I couldn't answer. I couldn't even move. All I knew was that we needed to get the hell out of there. I grabbed Sarah's hand, yanking her toward the front door. But before we could take two steps, the bathroom door at the end of the hall creaked open. Slowly. Both of us whipped around to face it, and my blood turned to ice. The bathroom light flickered on and off, like a weak bulb about to blow. I could see it. I could see the mirror, still shattered, the cracks running like veins across the glass. But what caught my eye wasn't the broken glass, it was the reflection. Standing in the middle of the bathroom behind us was a figure. It wasn't human. It looked like a shadow, tall and twisted, its head too high, its arms too long. I couldn't make out its face, but I could feel its eyes burning, seething, locked onto us. I blinked, hoping it was a trick of the light, some twisted illusion caused by my exhausted brain. But when I opened my eyes again, it was still there, still staring. Sarah gasped, her nails digging deeper into my arm. James, what is that? I couldn't speak, couldn't move. My throat was dry and my mind was racing, but I couldn't tear my eyes away from the thing in the reflection. It didn't move. It just stood there watching us, waiting. Then it smiled. The corners of its mouth stretched wide, far too wide like it was splitting open its face. Rows of sharp, jagged teeth glinted in the flickering light, and the sight of it made my stomach twist in knots. The figure raised one long, clawed finger and pointed directly at me. The mirror shattered again, pieces of glass falling to the floor like rain, and the figure vanished. But it wasn't gone. We heard it before we saw it, the soft sound of footsteps, slow, deliberate, coming down the hallway toward us. Sarah let out a soft whimper, her eyes wide with terror, but I couldn't do anything. I was paralysed, trapped in place by the sheer weight of fear like my feet were glued to the ground. The footsteps got closer, echoing in the hallway until they stopped, right behind us. I felt it before I saw it, this cold, freezing air like someone had opened a door to a frozen wasteland. I could feel it breathing on the back of my neck, cold and damp, like the breath of something that hadn't been alive for centuries. Sarah was shaking beside me, tears streaming down her face, her grip so tight on my arm I thought she'd tear my skin off. But neither of us could turn around. Neither of us could move. I don't know how long we stood there, waiting, terrified to even blink. It could have been seconds, it could have been minutes. But then, out of nowhere, the lights flickered again and the breathing stopped. For a second I thought maybe it was over. Maybe whatever that thing was had left us alone. But then Sarah's body went rigid. Her eyes rolled back in her head and she let out this guttural choking sound like she was being strangled. Sarah! I grabbed her, shaking her but she didn't respond. Her whole body went limp in my arms and her skin turned cold, ice cold. I felt a burning sensation on my arm where she'd been gripping me and when I looked down my skin was covered in deep fresh scratches. Five long claw marks, blood seeping out of them like they'd been carved with a knife. I dragged her out of the hallway, trying to get her as far away from that thing as possible, but no matter how hard I tried, she wouldn't wake up. Her eyes were half open, but there was no life in them, like she was in some kind of trance. That's when I heard it again, the voice. You can't run, James. It wasn't coming from the hallway anymore. It was inside my head, reverberating around my skull like it was bouncing off the walls of my mind. I clutched my head, trying to block it out, but it wouldn't stop. I'm inside you now. I don't know how to describe the feeling that washed over me in that moment. It was like every ounce of hope drained out of me, replaced with this suffocating sense of dread. This thing, whatever it was, it wasn't just in my house anymore. It was inside me. I didn't know what else to do, so I ran. I picked up Sarah's limp body, threw her over my shoulder and ran out of the house. I didn't stop until I was in the front yard, breathing hard, my heart pounding like a jackhammer in my chest. I dropped to my knees, still holding on to Sarah, who was barely breathing. I looked back at the house, half expecting to see that figure standing in the doorway, smiling that same horrifying smile. But there was nothing, just the dark silhouette of my house looming in the night. Sarah finally stirred gasping for air like she'd been underwater. She looked up at me, her face pale, her eyes wide with terror. We... we need to go, she whispered, her voice weak. 
barely audible. We can't stay here. I nodded, not saying a word. We got in my car and drove. I didn't know where we were going. I didn't care. All I knew was that I had to get as far away from that house as possible. But as I drove, something inside me shifted. I felt it. A presence. A weight. Like something was sitting in the passenger seat watching me. I glanced in the rearview mirror and for just a second I saw it. Those red, glowing eyes staring back at me. And then it whispered again. You can't escape. I drove for hours. I didn't even know where I was going. My hands were shaking so badly I could barely keep the car on the road. Every time I glanced in the rearview mirror I half expected to see those glowing red eyes again. Sarah was curled up in the passenger seat, barely conscious, her breathing shallow. She hadn't said much since we left, and honestly I didn't know if she was going to make it through the night. But I couldn't stop. Not yet. It wasn't until we hit the outskirts of town that I realised how bad things really were. Every light I passed, street lights, headlights, even the neon signs from the gas stations flickered. It was like the darkness was following us, creeping closer with every mile. The air felt heavy, thick, like the world was pressing down on me. I kept driving, hoping that somehow if I just kept moving it would stay behind us. But deep down, I knew the truth. It was already inside me. Sarah stirred beside me, her voice barely a whisper. James, where are we going? I don't know, I muttered, gripping the wheel tighter. I just need to get us out of here. She nodded weakly, but I could tell she was fading fast. Her skin was pale, almost translucent, and there were dark circles under her eyes. I kept glancing over at her, terrified she might pass out again, or worse. But what scared me more than anything was the feeling that she wasn't the only one in the car with me. Every time I blinked, I saw it. The figure, sitting in the back seat, those eyes burning into the back of my head. I tried to focus on the road, but my mind was racing, replaying everything that had happened. The Ouija board, the mirror, the scratches, the laughter, and that voice. It had burrowed its way inside me like a parasite, and now I couldn't shake it. Even when I wasn't hearing it, I could feel it like it was part of me now. I didn't know how to fight it, didn't know if I could fight it. All I knew was that it wasn't going to stop until it had me completely. We were miles outside of town, on some old empty highway when Sarah started coughing. At first it was just a few small coughs, but then it grew worse. Her whole body shook as she hacked and gasped for air. Her hand clutched tightly over her mouth. I pulled over, panic rising in my chest. Sarah! I shouted, reaching over to her. What's happening? Are you okay? She didn't answer. She just kept coughing harder and harder until finally she pulled her hand away from her mouth and I saw it. Blood. Dark, thick blood dripping down her chin. Her eyes were wide with terror as she looked at me, her hands shaking uncontrollably. I... I don't... She started, but she couldn't get the words out. Her eyes rolled back into her head and she slumped against the seat, limp and lifeless. Sarah, I screamed, shaking her, but she didn't respond. Her chest wasn't rising, she wasn't breathing. I scrambled to check her pulse, but there was nothing. No heartbeat, no life. She was just gone. I screamed again, louder this time, my voice cracking as I pounded on the steering wheel. This couldn't be happening, not now, not to Sarah. She couldn't be dead, not because of this, because of me. But then... Through my tears, I heard it again. That laugh, louder this time, closer. It filled the car, reverberating off the windows, shaking the very air around me. I whipped my head around and there it was. The figure, sitting in the back seat, grinning that same horrifying toothy grin. Its eyes glowed brighter now, burning into my soul, and its long, twisted fingers tapped lightly on the back of my seat. You can't escape, James. I wanted to scream, but the sound caught in my throat. My whole body was paralysed with fear. I couldn't move, couldn't think. All I could do was stare as the thing leaned closer, its breath cold and foul against the back of my neck. She's mine now. My heart stopped. I looked back at Sarah's lifeless body, and for the first time I noticed something. Her eyes, half open, dull and lifeless, weren't her eyes anymore. They were red, glowing just like the figures. I couldn't breathe. 
I scrambled out of the car, stumbling onto the side of the road, gasping for air. The laughter followed me, echoing around the empty highway, filling my ears, my mind, my soul. I could feel it inside me like a poison spreading through my veins. I ran. I don't know where I thought I was going, but I ran as fast as I could, my feet pounding against the pavement. The air was freezing and my lungs burned, but I didn't stop. I couldn't stop. I kept running, kept trying to outrun whatever the hell had taken over my life. But you can't run from something that's already inside you. I collapsed after what felt like hours, my body giving out, my legs cramping. I was miles from the car now, but the laughter was still there, in my head, in my bones. I knew it was only a matter of time before it found me again, before it took me, just like it had taken Sarah. I looked up at the sky, my vision blurry with tears, and for the first time in my life, I prayed. Not for salvation, not for forgiveness, just for an end. An end to the fear, an end to the pain, an end to whatever this was. But as the darkness closed in around me, the last thing I heard was the voice. You'll never be free, James. Never. I haven't gone back to the house since that night. I'm not even sure where it is anymore. I've been living in motels, moving from place to place, trying to keep ahead of it. But it's always there, always watching. Sometimes I'll see it in reflections, those red eyes, just for a second before they disappear. Other times I'll hear the whispers late at night coming from the corners of the room. I don't know how much longer I can keep running. My body's giving out and I haven't slept in days. The scratches are getting worse, deeper. It knows I'm almost done. It's just waiting for me to break completely. So, if you ever find yourself messing with something you don't understand, something you think is just a game, don't. Take it from me. Once you let it in, it never leaves. It never lets you go. Story. Number two. I know people always say Ouija boards are nothing but cardboard and ink, but I swear on my life, what happened to me and my sister was real. I've never told anyone this in full, but I think it's time to get it out there. You can judge me, say I'm lying, but I lived through it. And I'm telling you, don't ever touch one of those things, not even as a joke. It started when my sister Leah and I were cleaning out our grandma's attic. She'd passed away about a month before, and the family was taking turns sorting through her stuff. Grandma was always a bit off. I mean, she was sweet in her own way, but she believed in all sorts of superstitions. I never thought much of it, just figured it was one of those old people things. But when Leah found that Ouija board, I swear, a part of me froze on the spot. The board was tucked away in this old dusty trunk surrounded by a bunch of random knickknacks. It was worn with faded lettering and a planchette that looked like it had seen better days. Leah, being the impulsive one, immediately pulled it out and grinned at me. Want to try it? she asked, already clearing a space on the floor. I was hesitant, but at the same time we were bored. What's the worst that could happen, right? We set it up right there in the attic, sitting cross-legged with the board between us. I'm not going to lie. The air felt heavy, like weirdly thick, and it wasn't just the dust. But Leah shrugged it off, so I did too. We started the usual way, fingers lightly on the planchette, asking questions like, Is anyone here with us? And what's your name? For a while, nothing happened. I was about to make some sarcastic comment when the planchette moved. Not like a tiny nudge, but it slid. I thought Leah was messing with me at first, but the look on her face said otherwise. We both went silent, watching as it slowly spelled out. T-R-A-P-P-E-D. Trapped, Leah whispered. I tried to play it cool even though my heart was already racing. Okay, maybe it's just random, I said, forcing a laugh. But then Leah asked, who's trapped? And the planchette moved again. This time it was faster, more aggressive. M-E. I pulled my hands away. Leah, seriously, I don't like this. But she was fixated. She kept asking questions and it kept answering. The thing was, the more we played, the darker the room seemed to get. Like, I know it was the attic and all, but it felt like the shadows were creeping in closer. The air felt suffocating, heavy, in a way that made my skin crawl. But Leah wouldn't stop. Then it said something that made my stomach drop. C-O-M-E-F-I-N-D-M-E. -E. Find you? Where? Leah asked, her voice shaky now. The planchette spelled out one final word. B-E-L-O-W. The room went dead silent. We sat there for what felt like hours, staring at the board. 
I wanted to leave, but Leah stood up, her face pale. She walked over to a small door in the corner of the attic. I had no idea it was there until she opened it. Behind that door was a set of stairs leading down. They didn't look like they'd been used in years. Dust caked every step. I tried to stop her, but Leah was already descending into the darkness. Leah, don't, I yelled, but my voice sounded so small, like it was being swallowed by the air itself. Against my better judgment, I followed her. At the bottom, we found ourselves in a room, but it wasn't like any room in the house. This place was different. The walls were lined with iron bars, like a cage. The smell hit me first, that sickly, sweet smell of rot. My stomach churned and I gagged, trying not to throw up. Leah, let's get out of here, I begged. But she was already walking towards something in the middle of the room. It was a bed, old and rusted, with chains hanging from the corners. But what was on the bed? It's hard for me to even write this. It was a body, no, more like bones, wrapped in filthy, decaying sheets. I wanted to believe it was a mannequin or something, but the stench told me otherwise. And then it moved. I swear to God, it moved. The bones twitched, rattling against the metal bed frame, and Leah screamed. I grabbed her arm, yanking her back, but the door behind us slammed shut. We were trapped. I banged on the door, screaming for someone, anyone, to help us, but the room just seemed to swallow the sound. And then... Then the whispering started. At first I thought it was just in my head, but Leah heard it too. A soft, raspy voice echoing from the walls. It said things I can barely remember now. But one sentence stood out. You let me out. Now I'm free. I was shaking, my entire body trembling, and Leah was sobbing next to me. We were in that room for what felt like hours, with the thing on the bed occasionally twitching, the voice growing louder, more demanding. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, the door creaked open. I don't know how, and I don't care. We ran. I didn't look back, didn't try to make sense of it. We ran out of that house, and I never stepped foot in there again. But here's the thing. The worst part isn't what we saw or heard. is what happened after. Because Leah, she's not the same. She won't talk about it, won't even look at me half the time. And at night, I can hear her whispering to someone. Or something. I've checked the attic since then. The Ouija board? It's gone. The little door we went through? It's sealed up like it never existed. But I know what we saw. I know what happened. And I know that whatever we let out that day, it's still with us. It's been a few weeks since that day in the attic, but things have only gotten worse. I didn't mention this before, but Leah's behaviour isn't just weird anymore. It's wrong. She barely leaves her room. She's constantly whispering to herself, pacing back and forth, and she's been writing things, horrible things, all over her walls. I tried to confront her about it, but she just stares at me with these dead, hollow eyes like she doesn't even recognise me anymore. The sister I grew up with, she's gone. I tried to tell my mum about everything, but she's always at work. When she's home, she doesn't even notice. I swear, Leah's practically living like a ghost in our own house, and no one seems to care but me. I can't stop thinking about that room we found, the thing on the bed. I haven't told anyone else about it, because who would believe me? They'd think I was losing my mind, but I'm not. I know what I saw. The worst part is Leah's door, the one to her room. It's locked, and not like... Oh, she's locking it from the inside locked. It's like... it's sealed. I tried everything, banging on it, kicking it down, nothing works. I even tried to unscrew the door handle, but the screws wouldn't budge. I've never seen anything like it, and the noises coming from her room at night... They're getting louder. I hear scratching every single night. Sometimes it sounds like nails on wood, other times like something is scraping metal. And there's the whispers. They're not just in her head anymore. I can hear them through the walls, but they're not in English. They're not even in a language I can recognise. Sometimes it sounds like Leah's voice, but other times it's something else. Something darker. I've been sleeping with my headphones in just to block it out, but... Even then, I swear I hear something faint like it's crawling into my ears when I close my eyes. One night I couldn't take it anymore. I needed answers. I needed to know what was happening to my sister. So I did something stupid. I waited until mum went to bed and grabbed the spare key to the attic. If the Ouija board caused all this, maybe I could find something up there that would explain it. I know it sounds crazy, but at that point, I was desperate. I didn't know what else to do. I went up there in the middle of the night, the house dead quiet except for the occasional creak of the floorboards. I was shaking the entire time, but I had to do it. 
I had to. The attic was just as we'd left it, with boxes of junk scattered around and dust coating everything like a thick, grimy blanket. The air was still heavy, almost suffocating, but I pushed through it, heading straight for that corner, where the door was. Except, when I got there, there was no door. I swear the door was gone, like it never existed. The wall was completely solid, no seams, no cracks, nothing. My heart sank, I started to panic, tearing through boxes, hoping I could find something, anything, that would explain what the hell was going on. But all I found were old photographs, some creepy porcelain dolls and more junk. No Ouija board, no nothing. I was about to give up when I heard it. A soft thud. It came from behind me near the stairs. My body went cold. I slowly turned around and that's when I saw it. Leah was standing at the top of the stairs just staring at me. Her hair was a tangled mess, her skin pale and almost grey in the dim light. Her eyes, those hollow, dead eyes, just like before, fixed on me like I wasn't even her brother, like I was a stranger. But that wasn't the worst part. She wasn't alone. Behind her, barely visible in the shadows, was a figure. It was hunched over, too tall to stand fully upright in the attic, with long, bony limbs and skin that looked like it had been stretched too tight over its body. Its face. God, its face was twisted, the mouth hanging open unnaturally wide. But there were no eyes, just hollow, gaping sockets. It was watching me, though. I could feel it, even without eyes. I could feel it seeing me. Leah didn't move. She didn't say anything. She just stood there, breathing slow and shallow, while that thing behind her seemed to pulse, like it was barely contained in its own skin. Leah, I whispered, my voice shaking. Leah, please. She smiled, but it wasn't her smile. It was too wide, too wrong. He's coming, she said, her voice almost sing-song like she was talking to a child. He's almost here. I backed away slowly, my heart hammering in my chest, and I almost tripped over a box. I don't know how, but I managed to get down the stairs without breaking into a full sprint. I wanted to run, but something told me if I ran, it would chase me. So I just kept walking, slowly, trying to stay calm, trying not to look back. I didn't sleep that night. I couldn't. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw that thing hunched over behind my sister, breathing down her neck like it owned her. The next day, Leah didn't come out of her room. Not that she'd been much anyway. But this time, this time, the door wasn't just locked. There was something blocking it. I could see shadows shifting underneath the door, like something was moving inside. But when I tried to push it open, it wouldn't budge. I don't know how to describe it, but the door felt alive, like it was breathing against my hands. I tried everything to get in, yelling, pleading, banging on the door, but Leah wouldn't respond. She just kept whispering, and that thing, I could feel it. I could feel its presence, even though I couldn't see it. It was in there with her. It was always there. I've been sleeping downstairs ever since, terrified of what might happen if I stay too close to her room. I don't know what's going on or how to stop it, but I'm scared. I'm so, so scared. I can't shake the feeling that whatever we let out, whatever we released from that board, it's not done with us. Not by a long shot. And now I'm starting to wonder if I'll be next. I barely left the house after that night. Something about being outside just didn't feel right anymore. It's hard to explain, but every time I stepped out, it felt like it was watching me from somewhere, waiting. My life was shrinking down to a single point. Me, trapped inside these four walls, with Leah on the other side of her sealed door. I knew I had to do something, but I was terrified of what might happen if I did. A few days ago, though, things hit a whole new level of messed up. I woke up in the middle of the night to this banging sound coming from Leah's room. It wasn't the usual scraping or whispering. It was loud, like she was slamming something against the walls. My first instinct was to ignore it. I've been doing that for weeks now, but this time, it didn't stop. The banging kept going, rhythmically, almost like it was in a pattern. Bang, pause, bang, pause. It was driving me insane, so I finally grabbed a flashlight and crept down the hallway. As I got closer, the air around Leah's door grew colder. I mean, freezing. I could see my breath in front of me, and my skin prickled with goosebumps. I don't know why but my feet kept moving like I was being pulled towards the sound. When I reached her door, the banging stopped. Total silence. 
I stood there, my hand shaking as I reached for the handle. For the first time in days, the door gave. It actually turned in my hand, and I pushed it open slowly. The cold hit me like a wall. The room was dark, except for the moonlight creeping through the window, casting long, eerie shadows on the floor. Leah's bed was empty, sheets crumpled and thrown on the floor. My heart was pounding in my chest as I scanned the room, expecting to see her in the corner, or worse, expecting to see it. But then I noticed something far worse. The walls. They were covered in writing all over, in what looked like... blood. I stepped closer, shining the flashlight over the words, my stomach churning as I read them. He's inside me, can't escape, we let him in. It's too late, the writing continued. Some of it smeared as if she'd written it in a frenzy. But then my flashlight landed on something else, something worse. In the corner of the room, hidden behind a pile of dirty clothes and old toys, there was a cage. I hadn't noticed it before. It was small, rusted, barely big enough for a child to fit in, but there was something inside it. I approached cautiously, every part of me screaming to turn back, to get out of there. But I had to know. I had to see what was in the cage. It was Leah. She was huddled inside, her knees pulled to her chest, her face hidden behind her tangled mess of hair. Her skin was pale, almost translucent, and she was whispering again the same low murmurs I'd been hearing for weeks. I dropped to my knees in front of the cage, trying to get a better look at her, but every time I reached out, she'd pull back, deeper into the shadows. Leah, please, I begged, my voice cracking. Just come out, okay? We can figure this out, we'll get help. But she just kept whispering, the same words over and over again. He's coming. He's almost here. I tried to open the cage, but the lock wouldn't budge. I yanked at it, kicking at the bars, but it was like the thing was sealed shut by something stronger than just metal. I couldn't get her out, and she wasn't responding to me. It was like she wasn't even there anymore. Just an empty shell, repeating the same terrifying mantra. That's when I heard it. Footsteps. Slow, deliberate footsteps coming from behind me. I froze. My blood ran cold and every hair on my body stood on end. I didn't want to turn around. I knew what I'd see if I did, but I had no choice. The footsteps got closer, the sound of something wet dragging along the floor. I could hear breathing now, shallow, raspy breaths right behind me. I turned. It was the same figure from the attic. Only this time, it was standing fully upright, its lanky, distorted body looming over me. Its skin was grey, stretched thin over its bones, and those hollow eye sockets seemed to burn into me, even though they were empty. Its mouth was hanging open, too wide, like its jaw was broken, revealing a dark void inside. It raised a bony finger and pointed at me. I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe. All I could do was stare as it took another step closer, its twisted form twitching with each movement. He's inside now, Leah whispered from the cage her voice barely audible over the pounding of my heart. He's in you. I didn't understand what she meant, but something about her words felt wrong, like they weren't just words, like they were a curse. And as the thing got closer, I felt it. I felt something inside me shift, a cold, hollow feeling spreading through my chest, up into my throat. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't. My body wouldn't let me. Suddenly, the figure lunged. It moved faster than anything I'd ever seen, its bony hands reaching for my face. But just as its fingers grazed my skin, the door to Leah's room slammed shut. I was alone, alone in the dark. I don't know how long I was in there. Minutes? Hours? I blacked out at some point, and when I woke up, I was lying on the floor in my own room, drenched in sweat. My heart was still pounding in my chest, but there was something else now. Something knew. A voice. Quiet. Faint. But it was there. In the back of my mind, whispering. He's almost here. I can't stop hearing it. No matter what I do, no matter how hard I try to distract myself, it's always there. Whispering. Repeating. And the worst part, I don't know if it's Leah's voice anymore. I haven't gone back to her room since that night. I can't. The door's sealed again, and I'm not stupid enough to try and open it this time. But I hear her. I hear her whispers through the walls, the scratching, the banging, and that voice inside me is getting louder. I don't know what's happening to me. I don't know how much time I have left. 
but I can feel it. Whatever we let out that night in the attic, it's not just after Leah anymore. It's coming for me too. I don't even know how to start this anymore. I don't know how to explain what happened, what's still happening. I've been avoiding this for as long as I could, but the thing is, the more I try to act like everything's fine, the more I realise it's not. It's like this nightmare has woven itself into my reality, and I can't tell the difference anymore. Leah. She's not Leah. Not anymore. I woke up last night, again, to that familiar scratching sound. Only this time it wasn't coming from her room. It was coming from inside my room. I froze, listening to it for a moment, hoping, praying it was just in my head. But then I felt it, a pressure at the foot of my bed like someone was sitting there watching me. I couldn't move. I lay there, staring up at the ceiling, my body stiff as a board. My mind kept racing, telling me not to look, telling me that if I turned my head, I'd see something I could never unsee. But that's the thing about fear, right? It makes you do the exact opposite of what you should. So, I looked. Leah was sitting at the end of my bed. But it wasn't really her, not like I remembered her. Her skin had this sickly pale hue, almost translucent under the weak glow of the streetlights outside. Her hair was hanging in clumps, damp and matted, and her eyes, God, her eyes, were nothing but black voids. Not hollow, like before, just endless darkness, like staring into a black hole that pulled at something deep inside me. She was smiling, though, that same twisted, unnatural grin I'd seen in the attic, the kind that made my stomach churn, like her face wasn't built to smile that way. You can't fight him, she whispered, her voice distorted, like it was being filtered through static. He's inside now. I shot up, scrambling back against the headboard, but she didn't move. She just sat there, her head cocked to one side, her mouth still twisted into that awful grin. You're next, she said, her voice soft, like she was telling me a secret. It's your turn now. Before I could even react, the door to my room creaked open, and I saw him. It, the figure from before, standing in the doorway. Only this time it was different. Taller, its body more defined, like it had fed on something, grown stronger. I could see its bones shifting under its thin grey skin, and its mouth. God, that mouth, was wider than before gaping open like a void as if it was ready to swallow me whole. It stepped into the room, its long, bony fingers twitching, dragging along the floor as it moved closer. Every instinct in my body told me to run, but I was frozen, paralysed. My mind screamed at me, but my body refused to listen. He's almost done, Leah said, her voice low and taunting as if she was enjoying watching me squirm. When he's done with you, there'll be nothing left. I couldn't take it anymore. I jumped out of bed, grabbing the nearest thing I could find, an old lamp, and hurled it at the figure. It shattered against the wall, but the thing didn't even flinch. It just kept coming, step by step, its eyes, if it even had eyes, locked on me, watching, waiting. I ran out of my room, slamming the door behind me, my heart pounding so hard I thought it might burst out of my chest. I could hear them, Leah and it, moving around inside, their whispers mingling together, like they were having some kind of sick conversation about me. I didn't stop running until I was outside, standing into the cold night air, gasping for breath. But even then, I couldn't shake the feeling that they were still there, just behind me, watching from the windows. I haven't gone back inside since. I've been staying at a friend's place, but I don't know how long that'll last. I can't sleep. I can't eat. Every time I close my eyes, I see Leah, sitting at the foot of my bed, smiling at me with those black, empty eyes. Every time I hear a creak or a whisper, my heart skips a beat, convinced that it's found me again. I don't know how to stop this. I don't know if I can stop this. Whatever we let out that day, it's not just in the house. It's in me. I can feel it. Every day the whispers get louder. The voice in my head. His voice. It's telling me things. Telling me to give in. To let it take over. To let him finish what he started. And the worst part is... I'm starting to believe it. I don't have much time left. I can feel him clawing at my mind, digging deeper, taking control piece by piece. If I don't find a way to stop this, if I don't figure out what the hell we unleashed, I'll be gone, just like Leah, and then I'll be his. If you're reading this, please, please, don't make the same mistake we did. 
Don't mess with things you don't understand. Don't play with the unknown. Because once you open that door, once you let him in, you can't close it. It's too late for me. But maybe, just maybe, it's not too late for you. If you hear the whispers, don't listen. If you feel the cold, run. Story number three. I've always thought my life was pretty normal. Grew up in a small town, boring school life, basic family dynamics, nothing too crazy. But there's one thing I never like talking about. Something that still keeps me up at night, replaying over and over in my head. It happened years ago, but it still haunts me like it was yesterday. I was 22 when it all went down, and honestly, I don't think I'll ever fully recover. It all started with my girlfriend at the time, Jenna. We'd been together for about two years and things were getting serious. You know, the kind of serious where you start talking about moving in together, getting a dog, eventually having kids. Jenna was obsessed with the idea of us starting a family. She used to talk about it constantly. How many kids we'd have, what we'd name them, the whole damn thing. One night we were chilling at her place with some friends, just a typical Friday night. Someone had brought a Ouija board, probably for laughs, right? That's how it always starts. I wasn't into that kind of thing. Messing with spirits or whatever wasn't exactly on my to-do list. But I was outvoted, and everyone else thought it'd be fun. So there we were, sitting in her living room, lights dimmed, candles lit. For the mood, of course. And the Ouija board set up in the middle of the coffee table. I kept telling myself it was all bullshit. I mean, how could a piece of cardboard and a plastic planchette connect you to the dead? It's laughable when you think about it. At first it was all jokes. Everyone asked stupid questions like, who's going to win the next game? Or is Jenna's ex still stalking her? Dumb shit like that. But after a few minutes, the planchette actually started moving. Slowly at first, then it picked up speed. We all thought it was someone pushing it to mess with everyone else. You know how it goes. There's always one asshole who tries to freak out the group. Then Jenna, being the daring one, asked the board something serious. Will we have a family? she asked laughing like it was some kind of cosmic joke. The planchette went silent for a minute, just resting in the middle of the board. I was about to crack a joke about it when the thing jerked to life. It spelled out one word, no. Everyone stopped laughing. We all just stared at the board, waiting for someone to admit they were behind it. But no one said a word. Jenna, being stubborn as hell, asked again, her tone more serious this time. Will we ever have kids? The planchette moved again. No. At that point, the mood shifted. The air felt thicker, like the room was suddenly suffocating us. Everyone started getting uncomfortable, but Jenna wasn't done. She pressed on, her voice trembling a bit now. Why not? she asked, her hand shaking as she held onto the planchette. It spelled out, him. Everyone turned to look at me. I remember feeling this cold knot form in my stomach, like I'd swallowed a block of ice. I tried to play it off like it didn't bother me, but something about the way the planchette moved, so certain, so deliberate, made my skin crawl. Jenna looked me dead in the eyes, her face pale. Why you? I didn't have an answer. Hell, I didn't even know what the question meant. But before I could say anything, the board moved again, faster this time, spelling out words like it was in a hurry. He'll kill them. The entire room went dead silent. Not even the candles flickered. It was like everything around us froze in place. My heart was pounding in my ears, but I couldn't move, couldn't speak. I just stared at that board, watching the words form. He'll kill them. He'll kill them. What the hell does that mean? Jenna screamed, pushing the board away from her like it had just bitten her. Everyone else was freaked out, some trying to laugh it off, others too scared to even look at me. I didn't know what to do, so I stood up, feeling this overwhelming urge to leave. But as I turned toward the door, the candles blew out. All of them. At once. The room went pitch black, and before I could even react, I felt this pressure, like hands, wrap around my throat. I gasped, choking, clawing at my neck, but there was nothing there. I couldn't breathe. I heard Jenna scream my name, but it sounded far away, muffled, like I was underwater. My vision started going dark, but just before I blacked out, the grip loosened, and I collapsed onto the floor, gasping for air. Everyone rushed over to me, but I couldn't speak. I just lay there, shaking, terrified. After what felt like hours, someone finally turned on the lights, and I saw Jenna staring at me, tears streaming down her face. 
But it wasn't just fear I saw in her eyes. It was something deeper, something I couldn't explain. We never talked about it after that night. Not really. We tried to pretend everything was fine, but something had changed. Jenna became distant, and no matter how much I tried to comfort her, she pulled further and further away. A week later, I found her packing her things. She told me she couldn't do it anymore, that the Ouija board had freaked her out too much. She didn't believe in it, but she couldn't shake the feeling that it was right, that something was wrong with me, something dark. She left that night, and for months I tried to move on. But that wasn't the end of it. No, the real horror started after she left. I started seeing things. At first, it was just in my dreams, distorted images of children, mangled and bloody, screaming for me, reaching out with their tiny hands. But every time I tried to save them, something stopped me. Something invisible. Like a wall I couldn't see but could feel. And then it got worse. I'd wake up in the middle of the night feeling like someone was watching me. My bedroom door would creak open on its own, and I'd hear whispers. Whispering voices that I couldn't understand but knew were talking about me. Talking to me. But the worst part was the smell. This god-awful stench of rotting flesh that would fill my apartment every night. No matter how many candles I lit, how much air freshener I sprayed, it wouldn't go away. One night I woke up to find something in my bed. At first I thought it was a nightmare, but the longer I stared, the more real it became. There was a shape. Something small, child-sized, lying next to me, curled up under the blankets. I didn't want to look. I didn't want to see its face, but I couldn't stop myself. Slowly I pulled back the blanket, and what I saw still haunts me. It was a child, no older than five, with wide, empty eyes staring right at me. Its skin was pale and bruised, its mouth hanging open in a silent scream. And then I realised. It looked just like the kids from my dreams. I screamed, but no sound came out. I tried to move, but my body wouldn't respond. All I could do was lie there, frozen in terror, as the child reached for me, its cold, dead hand pressing against my chest. And then it spoke. He'll kill them. That was the first night I realised the Ouija board hadn't just been a game. It had been a warning. I didn't sleep for days after that. I couldn't. Every time I closed my eyes, I'd see that dead kid, feel its hand on my chest, hear those words. He'll kill them. The whole thing left me wrecked. I quit my job, stopped seeing friends, hell, I barely left my apartment. I thought maybe if I stayed put, nothing worse could happen. But I was wrong. It was just getting started. A few weeks after Jenna left, I started hearing noises. Not just the whispers I'd gotten used to. This was different. These were loud, angry sounds, like something, or someone, was trashing my place. It always happened at night. Like the wolves themselves were growling, groaning. I'd wake up in a panic, heart pounding, expecting to see my furniture overturned or windows smashed, but everything would be perfectly still, perfectly quiet. But I wasn't alone. I never felt alone. One night it escalated. I'd fallen asleep on the couch, too scared to even go into my bedroom. It was late, maybe 3am, when I heard the first bang. It wasn't subtle. It was loud, like someone had kicked my front door. I jolted awake, adrenaline instantly flooding my system. I sat up, holding my breath, listening. Another bang, then a scraping noise like nails on wood coming from the hallway outside my apartment. My heart was racing. I grabbed the first thing I could, a kitchen knife, and moved towards the door. My hands were shaking, my skin cold and clammy. I pressed my ear against the door and for a second everything went silent. Then came the voice. Let me in. I froze. It wasn't a voice I recognised, but it sounded close too close. Like whoever was out there was standing right on the other side of the door. The words were low, guttural, like they'd been dragged up from some deep dark place. Let me in, it said again, more forcefully this time. I backed away from the door, shaking my head, my grip on the knife tightening until my knuckles were white. I wasn't going to open that door, no way. But as soon as I stepped back, the banging started again, this time harder, faster, like someone was trying to break it down. I could hear the wood splintering, the hinges groaning under the pressure. I screamed out, Who's there? What do you want? No answer. Just the banging. Then it stopped. Dead silence again. I stood there, panting, the knife still clutched in my hand, waiting for whatever was next. 
After a few minutes, I started to relax, thinking maybe it was just some drunk asshole or a prank. I slowly turned back towards the living room, ready to drop the knife and forget this ever happened. That's when I saw the door to my bedroom creak open. I swear I hadn't even touched it. I hadn't been near that room in days. But there it was, wide open, darkness spilling out from the crack, and then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw something move. Just a shadow at first, darting across the hallway. I could feel the cold rush of air as it passed me, making my skin crawl. I backed up, every instinct in me screaming to run. But I couldn't. I had to know. I had to see what the hell was in that room. Knife in hand, I took slow, careful steps towards the open door. My feet felt like they were made of lead, each step heavier than the last. When I finally reached the door, I peered inside, half expecting to see the dead kid again or something worse. But the room was empty. No shadows, no figures. Just my bed, unmade, the covers thrown to one side. I breathed out, almost laughing at myself for being so freaked out over nothing. But before I could turn around, the door slammed shut behind me. Pitch black. I couldn't see anything. I dropped the knife, my hands fumbling to find the door handle, but it wouldn't budge. It was stuck. Locked. Jammed? I don't know. I started banging on it, shouting, but my voice just echoed back at me like the room had swallowed me whole. Then I heard the breathing. At first it was faint, barely noticeable over the sound of my own panicked breaths. But it got louder. Deep. Raspy. Like someone, or something, was standing right behind me. I could feel the hot air on the back of my neck, my skin prickling, my whole body locking up in fear. I didn't want to turn around. I didn't want to see what was there, but I had no choice. Slowly I turned, my heart hammering in my chest. There, standing in the corner of my bedroom, was a figure. A man, but not quite. His skin was pale, almost translucent. His eyes sunken and hollow. His lips were cracked and dry, barely covering his yellow teeth. He stood perfectly still, staring at me. But I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe. All I could do was stare back. Then he smiled. It was the kind of smile that makes your stomach turn, twisted and unnatural, like his face didn't quite know how to do it right. He took a step towards me, and that's when I noticed the knife in his hand. The same kitchen knife I'd dropped just minutes before. You're not supposed to be here, he whispered, his voice barely audible but full of malice. I backed up until I hit the wall, my whole body trembling. He took another step closer, raising the knife, his eyes never leaving mine. I was trapped, nowhere to go, and I knew, deep down, that this was it. But then, out of nowhere, the door flew open, slamming against the wall with a deafening bang. The figure vanished. Just like that. Gone. I stumbled out of the room, gasping for air, my whole body shaking. I didn't go back inside. I couldn't. I grabbed my keys, ran out of the apartment, and drove until I couldn't drive anymore. I didn't care where I ended up, as long as it was far away from that place. I tried to tell myself it was a hallucination, a nightmare, stress, anything to make it less real. But deep down, I knew the truth. The Ouija board had opened something, something dark, something evil. And whatever it was, it wasn't done with me yet. Because that wasn't the last time I saw him. He's been following me ever since. No matter where I go, he's there, in the shadows, in my dreams, waiting. And I'm starting to think he's not alone. I thought I could escape it. Whatever it was. I packed up my life into a few boxes, quit my lease, and moved across the country, thinking distance would somehow make this thing leave me alone. For a while it worked. I found a small apartment, started a new job, and tried to rebuild my life. But it wasn't long before the nightmares returned, and with them, the thing. The figure that I knew was watching me, following me. I wasn't just imagining it. The first night in my new place, I woke up to the sound of footsteps in the hallway. It was faint at first, like someone was pacing back and forth. I thought maybe it was my new neighbours, but the footsteps were too close, like they were just outside my door. I lay there in bed, listening, my heart pounding in my chest, trying to convince myself it was nothing. But then, the whispering started again. It was the same low, gravelly voice I'd heard the night my bedroom door slammed shut. The same voice that had followed me since the Ouija board. He'll kill them. Those same words, over and over like some twisted mantra. I squeezed my eyes shut, pulling the blanket over my head like a terrified kid. 
I stayed like that for hours, just waiting for it to stop, praying for it to stop. But it never did. It just kept going, relentless, until the sun started to rise. That was when I realised there was no running from this. Whatever I'd let into my life was a part of me now. I tried to ignore it, to go about my day like everything was fine, but the truth gnawed at the back of my mind. Every shadow, every creak in the floorboards, every passing face in the street. I saw him, that figure, that pale, sickening face, watching, waiting. And then came the visits. It started one night after I came home from work. My apartment door was unlocked. I was sure I'd locked it before I left, but when I got back, the door was slightly ajar. I felt my stomach twist as I pushed it open, stepping cautiously inside. Nothing looked disturbed. No signs of a break-in. I chalked it up to my own paranoia, even though deep down I knew better. But when I went into my bedroom, my blood turned cold. There, on my pillow, was a note, scrawled in jagged, barely legible handwriting with the words, You can't hide. He's coming. I stood there, frozen, my hand shaking as I held the note. My mind was racing. Who had been in my apartment? How had they gotten in? And more importantly, what did they want? That night I barely slept. Every time I closed my eyes I'd hear the whispers, feel the cold presence lingering in the corner of my room, and then I'd see him again, that man, or whatever the hell he was, standing there with that horrible smile, his eyes boring into mine like he was waiting for me to break. It got worse after that. The notes kept coming, I'd find them in different places tucked under my pillow, taped to my bathroom mirror, slipped into my jacket pocket. Always the same message. He's coming. I started losing my mind. I stopped going to work. Stopped answering my phone. I couldn't trust anyone. Couldn't even trust myself. Every time I left my apartment, I'd see him. On the street, across the parking lot, standing in the reflection of shop windows. He was everywhere. Then, one night, it escalated. I was lying in bed, wide awake, too scared to close my eyes. The apartment was dead silent. I remember staring at the ceiling, just waiting for something to happen. And then, I heard it. The sound of footsteps, slowly coming down the hallway. But this time, they weren't outside. They were inside my apartment. I shot up, heart racing, and grabbed the bat I kept by the side of my bed. I could hear the footsteps getting closer, moving slowly, deliberately, like whoever, or whatever it was, wanted me to know it was coming. My whole body was trembling, sweat dripping down my face as I gripped the bat, ready to swing at anything that came through the door, then the door handle turned. I froze, staring as the handle twisted slowly, the door creaking open. For a moment, nothing happened. The door just hung there, open, the hallway dark and empty. But I knew something was there. I could feel it. And then he stepped into the room. It was him, the figure. The man with the sunken eyes and the pale skin, but this time, he was different. This time, he wasn't just standing there. He was holding something. A child. A small, lifeless child cradled in his arms like a twisted trophy. I stared in horror as he stepped closer. That same sick smile stretched across his face. He'll kill them, he whispered, his voice dripping with malice. I tried to move, tried to swing the bat, but I couldn't. My body was frozen, paralysed with fear. I could only watch as he brought the child closer, pushing it toward me. The smell of decay hit me like a punch to the gut, and I gagged, bile rising in my throat. The child's face was pale, its eyes empty, staring into nothingness. And then the figure leaned in close, so close I could feel his cold breath on my skin. This is your future, I screamed. I don't know how, but I managed to break free, throwing the bat across the room as I scrambled to get away. I ran out of the apartment, down the stairs, out into the street, barefoot and shaking, gasping for air. I didn't stop running until I collapsed, my lungs burning, tears streaming down my face. That was the last time I went back to that apartment. I've spent the last few months trying to piece together what's left of my life. I've moved again, far away this time, to a place where no one knows me. But even here, in this new city, I still feel him. I still hear the whispers at night. I see him in my dreams standing at the foot of my bed, holding that lifeless child. I know now what the Ouija board was trying to tell us that night. It wasn't just some game, it was a warning. A warning that I'd never have a family, that something dark, something evil, had latched onto me. And no matter how far I run, no matter how hard I try to escape, it's never going to let me go. 
and now I'm starting to wonder if the real horror isn't that he'll kill them. Maybe the real horror is that I'll be the one who does.